Hello everyone, my name's Carly. Thank you so much to David and Rachel for inviting me to talk at your Autism Ambassador Conference this year. Sorry it's virtually. Sorry I'm sat in my conservatory. Um, as, as we're all all too aware, um, coronavirus has left us doing things a bit differently this year in, in many roles. So um, this does feel quite alien. So sorry if I if I stumble, um, I'd like to say I'm getting used to it, but not really. Um, <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm really pleased to hear about all of the work from um, Autism Hampshire and all of the all of the local authorities um, doing so much for autistic families and autistic people um, um, in your in your local area, and no doubt much wider as as well, which 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 we'll come on to. I should probably start with an introduction. Uh, my name's Carly Jones. I'm an autism advocate. I'm an autistic woman myself. I was diagnosed at 32 years old. Um, I'm, I'm now 38, rapidly approaching 39. Um, uh, but, but it was something that, that we'd known about for a long time, just didn't know what it was. We knew there was something different, knew I needed support. But, but had no idea that it was that it was autism um, and, until much later in life. Um, I'm also the mum of two autistic daughters. They are now um, 18 and 12. Um, and they were diagnosed at two and at six years of age. So, um, so, so a, a different scenario for them, which with that comes the first wave, which is a, a relief. It's a relief that they had their diagnosis. And then the, se the second, I don't want to say the second wave because it sounds very coronavirusy, but the second thought process after that is, um, oh golly, all of the things that I went through as a young person, if they're also autistic like me, are they going to experience all these really um, negative life events which, which, um, which, which happened to me? So that put me into um, advocate mode. Now I've got this written on my little notes of bits of paper here. Um, advocate means um, a person who puts a case of someone on, puts forward a case on somebody else's behalf. So although being um, an autistic adult myself really does help in a huge way to being an autism advocate, you don't actually have to be autistic to be an autism advocate or an ambassador. You need to be able to really understand that person's um, experience and, and, and current needs um, and, and then be able to speak about what, what they need, giving them a voice, a voice to the voiceless. That's what being an advocate is all about. Um, and I also uh, decided to Google the proper meaning of ambassador. I'm an ambassador myself for a few charities. Um, so I thought, actually, I should probably know what it means. Um, so ambassador, a representative or promoter of a specific activity. So I think that's, obviously it's quite broad, but I think in, in, in this case, um, you guys are doing that tenfold. So, uh, so, so thank you. Um, for me, even now, although I've been in advocacy, I started advocating before I knew I was autistic as well. I, I had a hunch. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a long, long waiting list for, for an adult diagnosis as well. And um, that kind of went through the mental health route as well. And I can remember being quite confused about that. Um, and, and I was terrified because I was a uh, recently divorced mum of three much younger children then, back when I first went for my diagnosis which I didn't get, that's another story. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it was terrifying because I thought, oh, goodness me, you know, am I going to be misunderstood by social workers and if, if I'm suddenly on this mental health pathway? Um, but that, that, was the, that was the road I needed to take. And I can remember seeing, um, seeing, a, seeing a, 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 a psychologist and um, I said, you know, I don't, I don't really think I've got any mental health issues. I just think I'm autistic. And um, I said, oh, what are your hobbies? And I said, well, I absolutely love acting. Um, and he was like, no, absolutely no way you could be autistic. So that was really puzzling for me because I, I, I used acting and still do. I still enjoy acting and, and dip my toe when I'm allowed. Um, but I, uh, that was really puzzling because actually when our children are diagnosed as being autistic, they say, write a social story. So say that was going to the airport, it would be, you know, 
this is what you're going to see, this is where you're going to be, this is what so-and-so might say to you, this is what you might say back, this is what's gonna happen when you get on the aeroplane and they're going to do the safety instructions and, and all of that jazz. Um, actually, that's for me, was a script. Scripts um, helped me understand what I needed to say, what the other person needed to say, perhaps where I should sit, uh, perhaps or I should stand. If I do something wrong, the director's going to yell cut. There's always a second chance. But real life doesn't have a script. Real life's much diff more difficult. If you say something wrong, people judge you. If you say something wrong, people might not want to be a friend anymore. You might lose a job. Um, so I often wish real life could, could come with a script as well. So that was quite awkward, actually, because I, I then later got my diagnosis with the wonderful Dr Judith Gould at the Lorna Wing Centre and I was I was supported very heavily by the um, National Autistic Society to gain to gain that diagnosis. I went to a conference and um, it wasn't just any conference actually I made a little short film using my acting uh, should I say skills? Probably not skills. Um, my, my love of acting. Um, and I made a short film and put it on YouTube. And I, I then, about autism and the lack of diagnosis for women. And I, I got an email from the National Autistic Society, kind of 2012, 13 time perhaps. And they said, oh, would you like to come and talk um, at, at, our, at our conference? So I, I just assumed it might be in a community centre or something like this. It was up in Harrogate. Now I'm, I'm down in Reading and it was up in Harrogate and I, I saw this stage and there was about 400 people watching and, and it was doctors, philanthropists, um, top, top psychologists, all the icons of autism. And, uh, and, I, and I stood up and, and, and did, a, did a speech about um, having autistic daughters and obviously thinking I was and explaining the life journey. And, uh, and there was a wonderful lady um, called Judy and she introduced herself as Judy and she was so nice and she was always asking me if I need a glass of water or a cup of tea and she really looked after me and I thought, oh, what a lovely volunteer Judy is, I really like her. And uh, then we had dinner that night and we were around this big oak table, it was a bit posh to be fair, and, uh, and I'm kind of there in my leather skirt and, um, and, and Judy was sat next to me at dinner. Uh, and at the end of the night, everybody gave out business cards. Now, I didn't have any business cards. I just got a bit of paper and wrote down my, my email address and handed it to, to the other dinner guests. And Judy next to me passed me her business card and it said Dr. Judith Gould on it. Now, Dr. Judith Gould is a woman that I had researched for, for at least five years. I, I had read everything she's ever uh, wrote and I... I I was just in awe and I couldn't believe it and I said to Judy next to me oh my god do you know Judy Gould <laughs> anyway turns out it was Judy Gould and um, and and on the back of that um, I, I did drop her an email I dropped her an email after watching I think it was a David Attenborough wildlife documentary about um, about tribes of orangutans that were able to deceive they were able to deceive the other orangutans because they, one tribe were giving a set of mirrors, a, 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 a self-identity. Uh, they could see the reflection of themselves and therefore they knew that they were different to everyone else and, and, and they actually learnt to lie. And I watched this documentary and I thought, oh, I don't have those skills. And, uh, and it kind of dawned on me a little bit more then that I, perhaps I do need to see someone. Although it's not a nice thing to be able to lie, it's actually a very good safeguarding skill. Sometimes you have to lie to get out of horrible situations. Um, so uh, I thought, right, I'm, I'm going to email Judith. And, um, and, and after that, we made a film again, using my, uh, <laughs> my special interest, a film called The Epidemic of Knowledge. Now, you've got to be very careful using the word epidemic in autism world because it's normally frowned upon um, due to, you know, people saying that we live in an epidemic of autism, which we don't. We live in an epidemic of our knowledge about autism, which means more people are diagnosed, self-recognised and, and, and X, Y, Z. So uh, I, I did get the diagnosis and that little film, which cost £250 in the budget, um, 
went to Cannes Film Festival and I went to go to Cannes, which was great. And that's the only time I've broken a rule. I don't like breaking rules, but I did break the rule at Cannes because you get a bit of paper and it says absolutely no selfies on the red carpet. And I did take a selfie on the red carpet very discreetly. Um, but uh, but yes, I had, that's the only time I've broken a rule because I thought, no, I'm not going up there. I'm not having a souvenir. So I did. I won't get invited back anyway, so it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, anyway, um, it, it was quite interesting because when you make a film, they uh, they ask you what the budget is when you're applying for festivals and things. And I said, um, it said, is it a zero budget film? I said, oh no, it's not zero budget. It's cost me 250 pounds. And um, but they were like, no, 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 zero budget means anything under 25K. So I think our film was a sub zero budget film. But the, yeah, the, the idea about it was to raise awareness of autism women, girls, late diagnosis. Why a diagnosis is so important as well. So um, there, are, there are many reasons why, uh, I mean, a diagnosis for me, I, and I say it time and time again, it was the first day of the rest of my life. I sent a lovely bunch of flowers to uh, the Lorna Wing Centre and to, to Dr Gould to say thank you. And the, the card on it said, thank you for the first day of the rest of my life. Because that's exactly what it was. Um, I, I'm, I'm better to uh, understand my needs, which means I'm less vulnerable. If you understand your vulnerabilities, you become less vulnerable. Safeguardings become, become my thing. And I, I think that we need to make sure that people are diagnosed timely for uh, many reasons. Often more wealthy families will say to me, well, we know that our child is, um, is autistic or our daughter's autistic. And, um, but you know, actually we've, we're, we're wealthy. They might say, they might say we're wealthy. So we don't need necessarily to rely on any, um, extra help from charities. We don't need to rely on any extra help from disability living allowance or, educational settings because you know they're loaded enough to either get a private tutor one-to-one -one full time or to put them in a private school where it might be four children in the classroom from the age of five to the age of 18 so they're kind of self-managing it self-funding um the, the the gaps the gaps where we could need support definitely need support um and i and i, I ask them two questions um the first question is should your young person, as an adult, you know, we don't turn 18 and then we're not autistic anymore, we're autistic for life. Um, and uh, I said, should your adult need to go into hospital? And the doctors answer where that they're autistic. Are they going to have a fair chance to getting better? The answer is no. We know the average life expectancy for an autistic person with an additional learning disability is 97, I'm sorry, not 97, no, it's not 97, 37, 37 um, years of age, which is shocking. And for those of us that don't have um, an additional learning disability, um, it's still kind of 15 years under the national average. So that's, that's, that's really worrying, obviously. But also, I don't think it's as black as white as you're either autistic without a learning disability or you're, you're autistic with a learning disability. There are, I think autism is incredibly fluid. We have uh, functioning labels. First thing you'll, people will say is, oh, you know, you're autistic. Oh, you must be high functioning then. Actually, maybe today I am. But, you know, put me in a situation where I'm under bright lights constantly without a 10 minute break here or there or without my sunglasses or without room to retreat to. I, I'm going to, to display very differently to you. Um, if I'm in pain, I go completely non-verbal. I was in um, in a hell of a lot of pain um, about a year ago. I had I was I was working far too hard, uh, both voluntary and and my paid job, and uh, and family commitments. I'm also a carer, as you know, um, and and I, I I went into a shutdown, which normally for me. Uh, will last a couple of hours and I'll be fine. Or, or I'll go to bed and then the next morning I'm fine. Um, and shutdown being the opposite to a meltdown, of course, instead of being very, um, very kind of obviously in distress, uh, there's, there's no lashing out, there's no um, false words or, or angry words said. It's, it's completely inwards. I'll go very, very quiet. Uh, sensory overload goes into a thousand percent 
lights hurt, everything hurts, um, my skin hurts, it's, it's horrible, um, and I would not wish it on my worst enemy, it's a horrible experience, and, um, and, and I can't talk. So I developed a migraine alongside this, this shutdown that was just, oh, from hell itself. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, and I was luckily, I was at my mum's at the time and she said, you know, I'll look after your youngest, get yourself up to the spare room, go to bed. And I did, and it was about six o'clock in the evening. And then it got to 11 o'clock at night and I, and I, I still couldn't talk. And it, it, the pain was, I, just being sick with the pain, it was so bad. So my mum got really worried and I was really worried, although I couldn't talk to her. So, um, so she rang the paramedics and, uh, and they said they needed to give me some medication, some pain medication that they couldn't give me unless I was in hospital. So I had to go to hospital. My eldest daughter, who's 22, bless her, was my advocate that day. So it's crazy, isn't it? Because I, uh, ha I advocate for, for everyone, yet I, I still need someone to advocate for me. And that's really important for, for advocates and ambassadors to remember. Um, so, uh, but obviously I, I had the medication, I was out of pain, I started to come out of this shutdown and kind of six hours later um, I, I could go home from hospital and, and the staff couldn't quite believe the difference of the patient they, they saw brought in who was non-verbal, not able to look at you, um, in, a, in a lot of pain and completely unable to, to safeguard themselves to someone who's standing up going, oh yes, blah, 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 we need to do this in the NHS, all right, you know, going on about my special interests. And, um, and, and, and I think it might have been a bit of a learning curve actually for some of, some of the staff there, although they were great. But, um, but yes, we, 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 we're not kind of fixed on this high functioning, low functioning. And the problem with, with functioning labels is those that are 80% of the time relatively high functioning, their vulnerabilities and their, um, their, their vulnerabilities are overlooked. And for, for those with um, learning disabilities, their abilities and talents and comprehension is, is, is vastly overlooked. They're completely underestimated. In the early days of advocacy, I got an email. And I know emails don't come in pages, but it was uh, about four pages long. And on this email, um, there was, um, I like big words. I like, as you know, Googling the words and seeing what, what, they, what they mean. But um, this, this email, there were, there were words I'd never heard in my life. And uh, so I thought, right, I'm going to have to Google these. It was incredibly intelligent. And uh, at, at the end of it, the, the chap said, here's my phone number. Please never call me. Just drop me a text because I'm completely non-verbal. And I'm so glad I got that email very, very early in advocacy years because I often think about that chap and that email and I and I, I think if he was walking the street, maybe with a carer because he doesn't talk at all, maybe on his own, what would people think about his thought processes? I'm pretty sure people wouldn't know exactly how intelligent he is. And, um, and I, I, I worry for the whole spectrum um, that we keep falling into grey areas of misunderstanding. Um, it's, it, it worries me a lot. Um, so I, I, I have some um, tips here. Oh, no, 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 before I go on to the tips. You can see I'm doing this about editing this morning. <laughs> um, before I go on to tips, there was another thing when uh, people ask me about, oh well you know we're loaded we don't need to go for the diagnosis also the implications for somebody that's autistic if they have to deal with the judicial system if they have to uh, either in court or, or with police or in custody so be that a defendant a witness um, the 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 um, the victim um, what happens for them because we have to be very careful in, in, in the courts that fair trial is given for people with hidden disabilities, particularly if they're autistic, because being autistic means that you have difficulties with language and communication. So um, I'll give you a good example. I have supported um, autistic women in court, um, either actually being sat in court with them or by providing letters and kind of helping with witness statements and telling them you know, um, not telling the autistic person, but telling the judge before they go in 
this is what support this person might need, could you get an intermediary? A lot of the time people have come back and said actually the intermediary um, would just basically read out the questions to them in a loud voice. Um, <laughs> or, or the problem we have though is that, you know, a lot of the time, yes, we can read, but we can't understand the context of the question. What is being asked by that question? So I'll give you a, a, a good example. I sported a um, incredibly um, fun, energetic, once happy woman and she um, she was hoping to get extra time with her child because the, the father had, had main custody. So um, they, she's autistic and they asked her to go on to a parenting course, which wasn't anything to do for autistic women, it was just, you know, your standard parenting course. After she'd been on said parenting course, they then asked her in court, so, you've been on this parenting course, what was the best thing for you? What was the best thing that you got out of this parenting course? And she said, well, actually, I met another autistic woman and I've met someone like me and we're actually going to go out for a drink on Friday because, um, I, I, you know, she's given me a lot of confidence, X, Y, Z, all that kind of stuff. And that was marked down as um, mother has no uh, concept of child's needs before her own, a blind spot in her parenting. Well, actually, she replied the question, honestly, she re replied to the question um, that was asked. They asked her, what did she get out of it? What did you get out of it? Had the question had been asked, so, you've been on a parenting course, what was the best strategies you learned to help you parent your child? I'm pretty sure she would have gone through all of the things that she had learned about because she certainly went through them with me. So it's very, very frustrating um, and, and, and tricky. So, and also the later the diagnosis, the longer the misdiagnoses happen. So there are many misdiagnoses, particularly for autistic women, many misdiagnoses, be it uh, borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, um, dissociative identity disorder, all of, all of these misdiagnoses because of the missed diagnosis and um, that's very unhelpful because obviously if you're supporting an autistic um, mother or a, a parent that's autistic it, it's it, and they've had a late diagnosis it may well be the case that they've been wrongly medicated in the past wrongly judged in the past and the minute that they need to um, kind of defend their ability to parent um, particularly in, in family courts and such um, actually a lot of this stuff comes out, comes out to haunt them and it was wrong in the first place. I, I feel quite strongly that there should be some sort of annulment, annulment for, for misdiagnosis. Um, so moving on, on my list of notes, um, David and Rachel said, you know, could you perhaps talk about things to empower um, uh, you know the autistic uh, autistic slash autism ambassadors um, and I think everyone has to have their own path and I, I don't know if if my tips would be of any help to anyone because I was lacking that social imagination but um, but I do have some tips here um, one thing I would say first of all is um, you have to be able to um, be really proud of yourself even if something that you wanted to help many many people seems to only help one or two because people often only even if one life is changed or one life is helped first of all that's enough that's enough it's better than it was before that's enough but on top of that it's the ripple effect so I can remember going to do a talk and um, it was estimated that maybe there'd be 30 or 40 people in this room. For whatever reason, there was one. And, uh, and I can remember the, um, the organisers saying, you know, you don't have to do this. It's, it's fine. It's, it's our fault. Maybe we should have advertised better, blah, blah. And I said, no, I want to do this conference for one person. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, I'm happy to do that. Reason being is actually, I don't know that one person's background. That one person could be a single mum with five kids at home and by having that one-to-one -one training she's going to have, that's going to affect her life, it's going to affect five children's life. It could be that that one person in the room is a social worker that works with 20, 30 children in the local authority every year, every month. 
it could be that uh, that it's a policy maker somebody that's going to hear one thing and go ah there's a gap we need to close which would in turn help thousands of people over decades okay guys sorry that i had to cut and paste a bit there um it's saturday morning here and uh the dog goes out to his dog walks on a saturday morning so i can do a little bit of work and um he leaves very early in the morning sometimes before 8 a.m and she knocked back so this is hunter the wonderful oh assistance dog there the autism assistance dog not mine my daughter's but i'm training so that kind of counts so i will round up with um some tips some tips that I've learned in my years of advocacy um, and being ambassadors. So I think the first one is you need to look after yourself. Um, being an ambassador can bring an awful lot of responsibility, often voluntary, often on top of everything else that you're, you're doing at home. And people that are asked to be ambassadors normally have a great deal, um, sorry the dog's washing there, it sounds disgusting, often have a great deal of personal experience in that particular cause because they have a lot of caring duties at home and um, and it's really important that you do look after yourself as well. The best quote that I like is don't quit rest. So every time I feel like quitting which I'll confide in you is often I think do you know what I should probably go off and work at Tesco's or I used to be a cleaner go and do my cleaning job again because sometimes the stress can really get too much so um, every time you feel like you want to quit just rest have a little rest have a nice cup of tea have a week off have a month off but don't quit that's my that's my top tip also seek out help from others P particularly not the naughtiest assistance dog in the world behind us here but um, seek out help from others what's going on young man sorry about this guys I'm so unprofessional the minute that the caring duties kick in it all goes to pot what's up What's wrong? Right. We will ignore the assistance dog that's not being very good at assisting. Um, so, yes, uh, another one is sometimes you've got to come across people with... Sometimes, never work with children or animals, ever. It never works out. Um, sometimes you've got to come across people with, which have, who have an opinion which actually you find really offensive. And, and, it, and it makes you feel very sad. No, you don't have to deal with that if you don't want to, but if you choose to, it's best not to close that conversation down. So I'll use the example of anti-vax. When people say to me, I'm not going to vaccinate my child because I don't want them to be autistic, it's really hurtful because I kind of think, you know, would you rather, grabbing a tennis ball, guys, would you rather, here you go, would you rather, um, you know, your child have measles than have a child like me? And that's, and all, all my children, that's really hurtful. But actually, if I was to completely close that conversation down and call them a prat or something, um, I, I'm not in a position to, to be able to share really helpful, true knowledge. So um, sometimes, if you, if you feel you can, if you can't, walk away, but if you feel you can, um, if you remain calm and, and just give your opinion, um, sometimes people might learn something even if they don't admit to it. Um, I'm quite a jokey person. I like making jokes. I like cheering people up and I often make jokes to cheer myself up or to check for context. You can always check for context with a joke. So a bit of a, a life hack there. I was on a Zoom meeting yesterday and we were talking about roles. It was near lunchtime I'm, and I'm thinking, we talk about job roles or we're talking about roles roles, you know, like what you eat. Uh, so I will make a quick joke um, such as, Ugh. Oh, right, yes, oh, yes, I'm hungry too. And then people, if people laugh, you know, they meant the other one. But jokes really help. Um, but actually, you can't be too jokey online if you're an advocate or an ambassador. Even if you're self-deprecating and you're taking the mickey out of yourself, that's not very helpful because the minute you take the mickey out of yourself by proxy, you're taking the mickey out of everyone that you represent or you work for. So I found that quite hard. I found that a challenge. And sometimes I still slip up now, um, particularly on Twitter but I'm learning. <laughs> um, yeah, looking after yourself, jokes, keeping conversation open to others. Um, and I think it's really important that we let guilt go. If things don't go right, which, which they often won't, um, let that guilt go. You tried your best 
and 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 that's all you could do you have to let the guilt go during lockdown unfortunately um i've, I've lost a few people that i that i helped to support to suicide and it is incredibly difficult to process and it never gets easier and i think the minute it does get easier i need to stop this job because it's meant to hurt it's meant to be upsetting um but you have to let the guilt of that go you tried your best and that's and that's all anyone can do in any situation um thinking about all the sacrifices you made and just being really proud of yourself when you're an ambassador or an advocate you will put many things on the back burner and it's not just you that's kind of sacrificing maybe relationships, social time, finances, um, at sometimes your mental health. Actually, it's also your wider family that sometimes have to sacrifice, you know, uh, the time it takes to, to do a Zoom or the time it takes to write something or, or, or develop something can be very, um, very tricky for our families because they're losing a, a nugget of our life too. So make sure that you get some rest. Make sure that you get lots of really good quality family time in between your advocacy and your, and your ambassador roles. Um, and just be really, really proud of yourself. What you're doing, whether anyone ever emails and tells you or not, what you're doing is changing lives and saving lives. I'm certain of it. I'm really looking forward to our questions and answers session um, on the 9th of November. Take care, everyone. Bye.